Hi, welcome again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice, and we have a very special songwriting show for you today. Uh, two guests. We're going to have Tom Gallant up first and hear what Tom has to say about creativity and songwriting. And then when we come back, you're going to hear from Laura Smith. So stick around. I hope you enjoy the show. Tom Gallant, we're going to talk about songwriting here. Is there any particular magic or chemistry that happens when you write a really good song? The break out in a sweat is what happens. Um, there's, uh, you know, it starts with the, uh, the feeling that, you know, I feel like I'd like to write a song. It's, it's almost like, like, uh, some kind of a biological urge. Mm -hmm. And so you sit down and you take out the guitar and you fool around, or just sit down on a piece of paper. And, Eventually a line will come or something will come and it begins to look like there might be a song there. If it's going to get finished at all, a kind of frenzy, well, it's very peaceful, but, but this kind of intensity, this focus gets ratcheted up, light changes a little bit. You're alone when you do this? Yeah. You have to be, well... What time of day is it? Usually it's... it's Eve, late evening or mm -hmm. uh, uh, or late at night when it's quiet and uh, so there's an idea there's a notion there's something that something that you there's a phrase that gets you started and you follow that phrase along and at a certain point you'll start to feel like this is going to become a song and at that point everything becomes more intense and more important because there's a possibility but you don't want to scare it you don't want to you know you know it's like creeping up on a on a on a wild beast in the woods to get a look at it you know if you if you come at it too ferociously it'll there it goes it's gone. Yeah. yeah you don't want to be too pushy it's funny about the, the songwriting is the weirdest of all the, you know i practice all of the anything that you can do with a pen i do it yeah. and that's the one that's the strangest you're not thinking about audience right then, are you? No. No, uh, the, uh, I think the thinking about audience is a more general thing. Hmm. When you're woodshedding the song, after the song is written and you're learning it, and sometimes it'll take, you know, some songs are finished in 10 minutes and some songs take weeks before that one thing that's bothering you about it'll go away, you know, before you decide, well, yeah, that's okay now. I mean, I've got songs that I've been singing for 10 years. I still have a line in it that I wish I could fix and I just can't. It's there and like yeah. uh, I was listening to your CD uh, called Dance in My Body. Yeah. Some good songs in there. The ones I like uh -huh. are the ones that have this certain kind of spirit to them. Uh -huh. That's very, very up. Yeah. This is, I mean, there's some bluesy stuff there. Yeah. There's some unhappy things, yeah. but the stuff that grabs me are these, these songs that are happy and they're not corny. How, yeah. how do you pull that off? How do you write a happy song that, that's not sort of a soppy kind of a thing? It's a funny thing, you know, it has to do with my definition of what a song is. But singing of itself, like I th I've talked to some blues guys, and they say, like singing the blues is to is a, is an is an act that that washes away the sadness. It's not wallowing in the sadness; it's taking the sadness away. Yes. I think that that's what music is supposed to do, essentially. Uh, sometimes a great sour, sorrowful ballad that makes you weep. Can take is an, is the kind of a catharsis Cathartic. that, that mm -hmm. takes away the the sorrow. But what for about some reason, songs? but these happy you, songs is a, is a funny it's a funny thing about that because I know that it's not fashionable to write a happy song, but I feel uh, a certain sense of I, I I feel a kind of a triumph in the act. You know, it's triumphant that humans sing at all. You know, it's it's wonderful that we do that. And, um, you know, there was a play I wrote one time where one of the characters said, I tried to write a play, a song about it, but, but it was too sad. It wouldn't have been a song, would it? Because a song has to, for me, they have to have inside them um, some joy somewhere, or the possibility of it, or the potential for it. What are some of those things that you celebrate? Just the idea about. that we're alive and kicking, you know. Hmm. Um, there's a, uh, well, there's one on there called uh, Wonderful Life. I guess that's about as, 
you know, you start thinking, well, there's the sappiest movie in the world. I wonder if that song's that sappy. But the first verse of that song is they're shooting in the city and they don't care if they, who they kill. You know, that's the first line. But that's where you're not. That's where I'm not. And the thing is that that song was a reaction to a new, an item that I heard on the news at supper time, you know, on the radio, about a drive-by shooting in Ottawa. And at the same time as I was hearing that, I had been out in the garden and I had found this crocus. And, you know, my wife was feeling kind of sad. She's got a head injury. She was feeling kind of sad that day. And I brought this crocus in and I put it in a shot glass, right? And put it on the table. Okay, that's... Well, so the song becomes that they're, they're shooting in the city and they don't care if, who they kill. Uh, da -da -da -da. I can't remember the words anyway. It's in there. But it, but it talks about the shot glass. And so the two things side by side. And then there's nothing wrong <laughs> with confessing your joy as well as your sorrows. And it doesn't make you... It, I think that right now there, in popular music there's this thing where you're not a heavy artist. You're not a serious artist if you're writing about joyous things. You gotta have angst, man. You gotta be angst ridden and you gotta be, well, I'm sorry, you know, I'm 52 and I've been through the angst thing and I've been through the angry young man thing. As a matter of fact, I went from angry young man to, you know, kind of goofy old guy without even being a force to be reckoned with. I don't know how that happened, but anyway. You've made certain decisions along your way and your very yeah. lengthy kind of career, and I think it's safe to say that you, um, that you leaned away from commercialism. Yeah. Why well, did you do that? I just didn't like it. I, I couldn't... I, I, don't, I don't think that I had... A, maybe I thought my moral center wasn't strong enough to survive it, to be really honest. Or maybe you were looking for something else. I was looking for something else, but I, there was one thing that when I was hot, in the 70s and I was the flavor of the month there for a little while and it looked like I could make it as big as I wanted to if I just kept with the program. I didn't like how I was behaving at meetings. I didn't like what I was thinking. I didn't like what I was feeling like I needed. I didn't like how that all was affecting me. It's not like I really understood it but I had to get out of town. I had to come back to the sea. And then other things started to interest me more. I'd had enough of, I was writing songs about the business. That's all I was writing about. You know, I wasn't writing songs about, about, uh, about finding a crocus or, or uh, you know, sailing to the Caribbean. That's like all those music interviews you see on MTV yeah. or something as people yeah. talking about, I made this album, I made that album, yeah. and you know, I, we sold yeah. so many copies. And they like, where's the content? You know, well, it's yeah, well, it's you know I, I went sailing. I found, a, I found this schooner and I'd always had this dream. And, and I went sailing and uh, all during the time that I was doing all of the things that I thought made a good life, I felt like my stuff my uh, writing and my singing was getting truer and more un, you know, more artless and and more open and more free, and that I had access to my heart in a in a more direct way. And at, on the other hand, that I had a little bit of a remove when I was sitting down to to write from the from the. Uh, 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 the, the, you know, the evil desires that suck the heart out of things, you know, this has got to be a hit. Yeah. I just don't give it flying fiddly if the thing's a hit or not. It, 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 I've heard so much trash that's become hits. I've heard great stuff that's become hits too. But some of my favorite albums, I mean, I'm sure your, 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 your record collection is the same as mine. I've got demos from friends of mine, acquaintances, that are brilliant beyond human understanding, that have been, you know, turned down by 37 record companies, yeah. and yeah, they're a lot brilliant. Of that out there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, it doesn't. None of that matters, and money is not life's report card. So for me, the 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 uh, the important thing is that the song be really true. And I guess if you're asking me why I can write an optimistic 
or, a, or an up piece of material and it's not corny, it's because um, that's the way I look at life. I look at life as being, I think this is a great planet, you know. I see all the bad stuff we're doing to it. So how did you get there? Have you had any like earth-shaking experiences that have really shaped the person you are now and these thoughts that we're hearing? Well, uh, deep water sailing, I had a couple of near-death experiences. You know, I was in a couple of storms that that was entirely, it was very likely for 18, 20, 30, 40 hours, it was very likely that I was going to die. And you're just soldiering on, you know. If this keeps going or if it gets any worse, we're not going to survive it. So um, yeah. by the time you get back into port, so by the time you have different get, thoughts. By the time I get through the storm, because you can't maintain your anxiety about the loss of life that long. Nobody can stay that anxious and that, that upset for 30 hours. You can't do it. You eventually have to make peace with it. And because you're so busy sailing the vessel, your heart and soul deals with that of its own accord, without yes. any input from, from you personally, so that your ego's not even in there. It's just, when it's over, and you sail into port, A, you don't need an attaboy. You don't need any applause to say that you've just come through it and you've done well. You don't need any of that. And, and the other thing is, the, the, you know, the smell of those flowers is pretty intense. And the, and the, you know, the taste of the rum and the, and the, and the, and the you know, the, the, the touch of a friend's hand on your shoulder is all so strong. And, and uh, I think there's a, and music is medicine. And you have the same potential as you do in witchcraft. Or like, I like the Native American way of thinking about medicine. But there's good medicine and bad medicine. And you bring that into your music. Yeah. yeah. And if it's good medicine, it supports life. Right. Now, I met up with you one day down in Lunenburg. Yeah. You were working in a boat shed. You were yeah. wrapping some kind of cable, doing something I didn't understand. I was rigging a boat, yeah. Yeah, it had to do with boats and things yeah. like that. What about the creativity and just day-to-day uh, -day hard work, physical work, that kind of thing? Is it a good combination, or would you rather just be writing songs? I like that there is an equal and opposite obsession. That was the whole thing about sailing. Because sailing was tactile, and um, it was um, uh, there was no vagary in there. I mean, you, there's a lot of good lessons in it. You can't sail directly into the wind. You can only go where the wind will allow you, and the sea will allow you, and what, yes. what the vessel will do. And so you learn to accept things as they really are, and all that. That's a good lesson. So I wouldn't like to be doing nothing but. I wouldn't like to be on the road, in a hotel, going out and singing my hit over and over and over and over again, and, uh, you know, crowds thronging to their feet at the end of the show because they'd heard a hit, and uh, all that has, has very little, uh, holds very little uh, charm for me. What does hold charm for me is to be sitting in a room full of people who don't know me, and for the guitar to land on my lap, and for the gods to provide me with the right choice of song for that moment, and to sing that song and have it go to their hearts. And that is what it's, for me, that's, that's the whole McGill. Beautiful moment. Yeah, Beautiful it's moment. the whole McGill. I think you and I are lucky. I mean, you live out in Lawrencetown, and you have a passion that goes against your writing. I don't know how in the hell you managed to get that good surfing and write that many books. You must be fast. It keeps me busy. You must yeah. be fast. <laughs> Because well, I'm, I'm not all that quick. I mean, songwriting, but yeah. the rest of it, pulling teeth. Well, thanks a lot for coming in and doing this. Oh, it's always great to see you, Leslie. Okay, take care. Yeah. Laura, good to have you in the studio with Thank us here today. You. Thank you. 
Now, your 1997 CD was titled It's a Personal Thing. Is, is that true of the music that you write? Is it really this thing from lived experience? Uh, most of the time. Or, or uh, lived perceptions of experience. You know, it's not often, or not always me I'm writing about. Fact and fiction sort of put through some kind of a, um, a mythical maze. Yeah, it's like I think there should be something else. Fact and fiction don't seem to be like enough categories. Mm -hmm. Where do you go with it? I think there's something in the middle there. Like if you, there's something between those two where a song goes. Does some uh, very special thing happen when it clicks? If you're sitting down with your guitar or sitting at a piano, do you know when the force is there? Yeah, yeah. It uh, takes a, some time. I know when I, I've started to write something, and by write, I should explain that I don't always write things down. Mm -hmm. It's all happening in my head. It's like making a movie. And I'm, I don't need to go to the page unless things get a little too complex for me to follow. And I, it's, there's the dog with the bone analogy. You know, I just, I know that I can't let the ideas go. They've taken on a life of their own. And now I'll just work till it's done. Do and the done words is come interest. first? Or the music? Or um, both at the same time? They tend to happen simultaneously. Like if I can, for me, I have to create a situation, a place where I can settle down to the work. You know, a comfortable chair, maybe. Um, know that there's food in the refrigerator, a nice view. And I start, I take my guitar out of the case. And I, this noodle. And it's like fishing, you know, like what, if there's an idea there, if there's something that's waiting, to, like I have an inkling, I have an inkling that there's work to be done. And I'll latch onto a note or a chord and it'll go from there, and the words and the music will work together. Well, that's interesting, and you have your set of requirements. You're not like Hemingway sitting down with the scotch bottle, but you... you no, I couldn't. <laughs> I could, I didn't, yeah, yeah, he's some tough bastard, really. I he couldn't. Is <laughs> I, uh, You're not Ernest Hemingway. No. Um, but um, somebody could say, okay, Laura, here's, here's a room, nice view. You're looking at the ocean, and I got some rocks, some seagulls, some waves coming in out there. We've got a refrigerator over there, it's, it's full of food write some songs for us. Would it work just like that? It would depend on whether they told me they were paying the rent, too. Mm -hmm. Pay the rent? Okay, yeah. <laughs> you got it. We're paying the rent. Yeah. yeah. I think if I had a... It's almost like a... you describing it like that. It, you, you make it sound like a leisure activity. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it is, you know doesn't really feel like it, but it can be described that way, like just knowing that everything's, that I'm not going to be interrupted. Yeah. That's like one of the big things. Mm. And that's a luxury in many people's lives, isn't yeah. it, to have that space? Yeah. But do, do you, you create it for yourself, or you yeah. go looking for it, make sure it's there? Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. There's, um, I, I look through your lyrics, and I listen to your lyrics on your CDs there, and uh, the songs about love and sadness, and so many pop songs about love and sadness sort of lean into very generic, cliched sort of areas, and you don't. Uh, Ooh, for example, you, you say, I dove down to the bottom of my heart, hot-wired a few feelings to see if they'd start. I like that. I like the automotive oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> metaphors and, and uh, descriptive elements there. Well, good. Tell me more about your writing process. Where, where did those descriptive I, passages come from? That tune I wrote a cappella. Made the whole thing up in my head. Mm -hmm. Sang it full blast. Walking around my apartment on a New Year's Eve. Carrying a tape recorder? No. It was later. It was much later that you just uh, put it on tape. I think I had a tape back in the house at the time. And maybe when I was done, I sang it into it. Mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to record it while I'm working. Only when it's finished. Right. Now, you're a fine vocalist, you're a fine singer, and mm. I hear a lot of other singers who will rely on the sound of their voice to carry some very, very basic kind of lyrics, it, almost as if 
it's like they figure, well, they've got the music and they've you know, got the, the, the great sound to go along with it vocally. So, you know, why bother to, to pay so much attention to lyrics? And I think you do pay the extra attention to lyrics to ensure that there's originality there and, and precision. Well, I didn't think of myself as a singer. I didn't start this because I felt I was a singer. Ah. It was, that's the bonus. As I started making up songs when I was younger, I liked the sound of my voice. I liked the feeling of the air going through my body and the emotions that it triggered. A good deep breath and a good note. Your body just vibrates it quite in a wonderful way. Mm. And I enjoyed that process. And it's, it, sometimes it's difficult because I'll be introduced as a singer when I just want to be a poet. Amazing, though, that yeah. uh, once you got going, though, Cape Breton was the trigger for it, wasn't it? That, uh, that your well, it was uh, took off? Uh, friends of mine. Uh, John Prine was coming through, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ron Kaplan, and I remember, phoned and said, you should open for John Prine. Let's see if we can make that happen. And then I got, then I opened for a debtor. So I was just making these little strides of taking well, taking advantage of someone else's audience, and which is the wonderful thing about being an opening act yes. is you, you know, the audience is all there to see someone that they admire, and if you know, luckily they'll be gracious enough to allow you your fifteen or twenty minutes on the stage. But then from there on, no bumps along the road. You know, we always get this impression that uh, you know the the very successful artist like yourself, recording artist, uh, singer, come somehow fully formed. Just yeah. where they are. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, sometimes it feels that way. Hmm. You know, I I I appreciate that myth sometimes myself too. Yeah, what's on a good day. You know, <laughs> another one of your lines. I've got a tramp's whisker that yes. tells me you still care. There's another one of those images that that grabbed me. Where did the tramp's whisker come from? Oh, it's a wonderful little story. Um, my roommate at the time, Ross McDonald, um, had come home right when I was at the line before that, which is uh, someone's got a kite on mm -hmm. the wind, mate and Colin. And I was stopped right there, that's where I was. And I sang it to him up to that point. And he started to cry. And I said, you know, what is it? And he said, well, have I ever shown you Tramp's Whisker? I went, no. And he went away and he'd been in India and he had a little carved wooden box, tiny. And he took the lid off it and a little piece of velvet was the whisker that he'd found oh. on his pillow after his dog died, his dog tramp. And I was just like, <laughs> okay. he was beside himself. Yeah. And I, he was inconsolable. And I said, so I just sang, I've got a tramp's whisker that tells me you still care. And there it was. And there it was. And anyway, delivered to you in the line. Yeah. And the tramp's whisker, it can be anything. It can be something that you'd never get. I but can't imagine being able to get a. Have to be pretty way brave to go up and pull a whisker off a tramp. I guess so. Uh, I thank you for that, Laura. So I hope you liked our very special songwriting edition of Off the Page today. Thanks to uh, Tom Gallant and Lara Smith. And um, come on back next time. I look forward to having you out there.